thank you very much. And uh, Lee, not only thank you for the extremely uh, kind and warm introduction, but the invitation uh, to join you on one of the few sunny days in Seattle. Uh, and it's a, a pleasure to see your new uh, facility. I was uh, in your original one in the early days, and uh, it's impressive how much it's uh, grown and expanded. So it's a, it's a, delight, to, uh, a delight to see. Um, Lee mentioned uh, the Venture Institute. This, in June, it will be our uh, 20th year. Uh, this is our campus in Rockville, Maryland, and we also have a campus, as Lee said, in, in La Jolla. And that, we're actually doing an uh, architectural as well as a scientific experiment. This is going to be the world's first zero-carbon research building, and we're building it on the UCSD uh, campus uh, with a, uh, just up the hill from Scripps Oceanographic. Uh, and so it'll have a fantastic view of the ocean, but it has to generate all its own energy, uh, recycle all its own waste. Uh, so if you want to come there for a drink of water next year, we'd be happy to provide it. Um, uh, <laughs> the city of San Diego won't sanction it because uh, uh, they, they want us to use their water system, but I, eventually uh, we'll, we'll have to go in that direction. So this will be completed uh, next fall uh, sometime. So it's, uh, right now it's a very large uh, a hole in the ground. Um, this is clearly what Lee was talking about, and, and you know, he absolutely de deserves credit for being the first one to go directly from the analog DNA molecule into the digital world. And, and I think his pioneering work uh, led to all the automation that uh, we and the rest of the world have, uh, have used. But th this has been the goal now of biology, is digitizing biology. Um, and I'd say since 1977 or so, there's been a huge amount uh, that's been digitized, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll talk about the other challenge that we had starting in 1995, is could we go the other way? Could we start with that digital world, recreate the analog DNA molecules, and recreate life out of that digital world? And so I'll talk about going through both directions. Uh, Lee mentioned uh, uh, the first genome in 1995. All this is based on randomness. ESTs were based on randomness, and as Lee mentioned, evolution is based on randomness. And the mathematics of randomness have uh, uh, played a role in not only all of us uh, being here, uh, but in terms of um, uh, how we mathematically reassemble genomes uh, and how these genomes uh, evolve. Five years after that uh, was, uh, I, I like Lee's term, uh, the more or less uh, first version of it, the human genome. Um, but it got more interesting uh, seven years later when we did the first complete uh, diploid uh, genome. And this is when we found human variation was about 10 times what we thought uh, uh, seven years earlier, uh, just having half the genome. And, it's actually, maybe you probably don't know, it's actually Lee's fault that we only had half the genome in 2000. Uh, we were at a meeting uh, uh, that NIH was sponsoring, planning for the human genome, and uh, they wanted to know uh, from Lee what he thought the lowest cost for DNA sequencing would be in the time course uh, of, of the human genome program, and he said a dollar a base pair. And so uh, they decided to ask Congress for $3 billion dollars for the haploid genome because they thought doing the complete human genome, we'd never get the $6 billion for it. So if he'd said 50 cents a base pair, we might have had it right uh, 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 from, from the beginning. But uh, having the diploid genome changes our view of things, um, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, but and as Lee mentioned, the biggest challenge now in genomics, to me, is digitizing the human phenotype. And we just heard a number of marvelous uh, discoveries that are going to help do that. But defining the human phenotype is actually the biggest problem. Digitizing it once it's definable uh, is the next phase. But sequencing more human genomes has basically zero scientific value other than for, I'll show you, tracking populations and understanding evolution. Uh, until we can do this much more massive calculation of all against all having a complete human phenotype. 
Uh, we can't tell much more looking at anybody's genome today than uh, uh, when uh, uh, you know, six years ago we tried to analyze my genome. Because there's such a real absence of comprehensive uh, multivariant analysis of genomics, in fact, uh, uh, Joe Goldstein and I and others have been urging journals not to publish uh, SNP studies any longer on single genes because they basically just clog the literature with uh, mostly meaningless uh, drivel. Um, but as Lee said, he and I have never had opinions on anything. Um, so the haplotype is important. So how do you get a, uh, uh, a complete uh, human haplotype with haplotype phasing? Obviously, if you have enough coverage of the genome and enough variants, you can mathematically uh, get there. Uh, we've been using single cell genomics to do this. So this was pioneered by Roger Laskin at the Institute. We can actually sort uh, sperm cells, pick single sperm cells, and sequence them uh, with shotgun sequencing. And depending on the cell, we get 30 to 60 percent coverage. What we found is there's only an average of one crossover per chromosome. So simply by just doing uh, uh, a handful is probably the wrong term to use, um, just a, a small number of sperm cells, uh, you, you can actually uh, <laughs> you can actually generate a, a complete uh, phased uh, human genome and. We have these uh, uh, complex uh, uh, heterozygotes now that show up uh, by having a complete phased human genome. So if you want to know what traits you got from your mother and what traits you got from your father, you have to have your chromosome uh, phased into haplotypes. Uh, Vanessa Hayes at the Institute has been uh, studying uh, global evolution and human diversity, uh, sequencing genomes primarily of ancient populations in Africa and it's traced down what she thinks is the most ancient uh, one, but she was the first to do the, the Bushman genome and uh, uh, those who came to our, our 10th anniversary uh, genome party uh, uh, last year, uh, Desmond Tutu was there, he had his uh, genome sequenced. And from all this analysis uh, with the Beijing uh, Genome Institute doing a Hun Chinese, early on we had a Bushman uh, from Africa, we had my genome and a Hun Chinese, and all this came out within the 1 to 3 percent variation that you'd expect. When we look just in Africa, there's more diversity within African populations than between any African population and any other one on the planet, in part because there were migrations out of Africa early on that obviously led to all of us, uh, but the, some of those migrations went back into Africa after acquiring perhaps interactions uh, with Neanderthals, and so Africa is probably the most complex mixture uh, along with some of the most ancient genomes. Rendon just came to play again uh, after we did the shotgun sequence in the human genome in, in 2000, uh, looking for ap other applications of the randomness approach, and we started looking at environments. And uh, Karen Nelson uh, did the first study on uh, what's now become the microbiome from shotgun sequencing uh, from the gut. Uh, and this has probably been one of the most rapidly uh, expanding uh, fields. Early on, in addition to our 22 or 23,000 human genes, it became clear we have maybe 10 million or so additional genes associated with each of our physiologies. These are responsible for producing a third of the chemicals circulating in our bloodstream at any one time, both from taking human metabolites and metabolizing those, and also everything we eat, uh, creating new metabolites uh, from that. Um, uh, Karen had a team uh, for the catalog of reference human genomes just trying to get complete genomes to start to characterize this, uh, but this is very early on and we need to go up uh, orders of magnitude. But changes in the microbiome, as I know many of you are working on, are associated with an increasing uh, number of diseases. In fact, the world is recognizing this very quickly and major food companies are trying to measure the microbiome particularly associated with obesity and diabetes, and see if they can actually come up uh, with new uh, chemically defined sets of food to change the microbiome, or as Lee said, even uh, ultimately uh, uh, directly changing the microbiome. I, I proposed this initially uh, uh, for NASA astronauts. Uh, when you look at complex environments like the space station, 
every new astronaut or cosmonaut that goes up there uh, takes uh, a few billion new microbes that haven't been there before. And so if we're going to really do long-term colonization of Mars or somebody else, we want to rid somebody of their entire microbiome and create an artificial one uh, and give them that. Uh, so I, I think what he proposed is not far off. We also did uh, shotgun sequencing in the oceans, and this is still ongoing. Um, uh, from a complete circumnavigation uh, covering both coasts, including sampling off of, uh, of Seattle and up to Glacier Bay. Uh, we're getting ready to uh, head down to the Amazon River uh, uh, this next year uh, for some sampling in complex environments. Uh, this led to a big surprise in, in 2003, 2004, that these microbial environments were orders of magnitude more complicated than anybody imagined. And it was thought that, uh, for example, we started the Sargasso Sea because when we proposed this in 2001 or 2002 to the DOE, they said these environments are so simple, they're not going to be that interesting. There's only a few microbes there, and you'll just be sequencing the same things over and over again. Uh, the study stopped when we hit 1.3 million uh, new genes, uh, and that led to an expansion uh, a few la years later this uh, 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 a special issue of uh, PLOS uh, biology, uh, and the studies go on. So uh, uh, two years ago, we were sampling in the Baltic Sea, which goes from a uh, complete freshwater uh, system to a saltwater system. Uh, then we had really tough duty uh, uh, sailing from uh, Italy into Greece and uh, um, uh, sampling up into the Black Sea. Uh, he joined us for a major press conference and, and party in Spain on, on board uh, the, the expedition. So here's an example. SAR-11 was the 11th organism discovered in the Sargasso Sea and was thought to be a single organism. With the shotgun sequencing, here's early data on. This is just uh, uh, Doug Rush at, uh, was in at the Institute created this graphic model where you can put a reference genome across the top. And each of these bars are roughly 900 base pairs of sequence. And you can see how they match up against the reference sequence. It turns out there's tens of thousands of variation of SAR-11. Uh, basically, all these different variations are largely the same genes in the same gene order. But unlike our 1 to 3 percent variation, there's up to 50 percent sequence variation with largely the same gene order. Um, we expected uh, that tighter band. We only see that in one place, and that's in the deep earth. And what's different in the deep earth versus the ocean? That's lack of UV light, uh, lack of oxygen, uh, both what I consider the two biggest drivers of evolution. And so these organisms are constantly uh, exposed uh, to both, actually generating oxygen. And so they get tremendous uh, diversity uh, building out of those interactions. As we get more and more data, it starts to coalesce again. Uh, but as major taxa, and these taxa are around what people thought were single organisms. So what 10 years ago people thought were single species are tens to uh, even larger numbers of thousands uh, of organisms. In fact, we can actually compile uh, genomes completely uh, from just this random sampling. SAR-86, which is, uh, was one of the ones totally discovered by this and one of the most abundant ones, the genome was completely assembled and multiple versions of the genome were assembled. We've taken this uh, with funding from the Sloan Foundation to sample the air and with a group uh, the size, the air uh, is uh, loaded uh, with microbes. This was, it's taken us a long time uh, to solve this problem, uh, the sampling uh, and eliminating, as Lee said, the, the noise uh, from the data. It was a real problem. Uh, one of the biggest problems in New York City is all the contaminants in the air. The biggest contaminant that interfered with DNA sequencing was iron. So finally, uh, just by pulling out the iron out of these uh, uh, cell samples filtered out of the air, uh, we were able then to get a, a good DNA sequencing. So in theory, there should be very little anemia uh, in New York uh, with, uh, with all the iron. And so it's similar to what we did with the global ocean sampling of uh, uh, filtering uh, uh, microbes and separating that way, and then shotgun sequencing uh, everything that was on the filters. And, we sampled in downtown Manhattan. Uh, we can't name the building, but there was a, a major financial firm in this building, which may explain some of the data you'll see in a minute. Uh, 
Uh, we also sampled uh, in and out of a hospital in San Diego and then out of a home. And uh, Farouk uh, is here off the end of Scripps uh, up here, uh, just looking at different examples. And now we have also all the HEPA filters uh, from the, the, the space station, so we can see all these different microbes that uh, uh, every astronaut and cosmonaut has uh, taken in there. And this is just a quick summary, and it was quite surprising. So this is not taking free DNA. It's taking cells out of the air. So New York indoor air, 60% was human, but 15% was rodent DNA. Um, uh, and if you knew the financial firm, you would understand. Uh, uh, bacteria, plant DNA, other animals, insects, uh, fungi. Uh, New York City outdoor, 46%, and this was at the level of the 22nd floor, is rodent DNA. Uh, initially, we thought this was going to be rat DNA just out of a bias. Uh, it turns out it's mostly uh, mouse DNA. But at the level of the 22nd floor in New York City, 15% of the cells in the air are human cells. Insects, fungi, other animals. And obviously, these kind of studies depend on which way the wind's blowing, if it's blowing off the ocean or off the of farms or not blowing at all. San Diego is clearly a much cleaner environment. Um, so in the, in the hospital, in the house looked pretty much the same. Uh, uh, mostly uh, bacteria, some plant, a little bit of rodent, insect DNA. Outside the hospital, obviously more plant uh, DNA. The endoscripts pier is mostly uh, insect DNA and some uh, marine algae, uh, um, some uh, actually marine mammal uh, organisms, and human from all the surfers that hang around uh, Scripps Pier. So just sampling what's in the air can tell you a lot about an environment. When we look at the house versus the hospital, though, it's, it's uh, kind of interesting. The hospital is loaded with pathogens in the air, and the home is not. So it's not surprising, maybe, that people get sicker when they go to hospitals. Uh, and so it's a question of how to get this you know, in a much more uh, quantitative function, and can it be used as a measure to help improve uh, environments. So with all this kind of environmental sequencing, I mean, we're approaching 100 million uh, genes in these databases, and uh, uh, Larry Smart is here. You can talk about the, uh, uh, the camera database that the Moore Foundation funded to house uh, uh, environmental uh, genome data like this. When we look at mammalian genes, it's basically saturating. So if you find another mammal and sequence its genome, you're not likely to discover uh, too many more genes or a rare human. Uh, but if you look at the rest of the environment in terms of uh, uh, eukaryotic uh, species, uh, fungi, uh, single cells, uh, viruses, bacteria, we're still in a linear phase of discovery. So any student can go outside here, take an ear sample, take a water sample, take a soil sample, take a microbiome sample, uh, and make discoveries uh, that have never been seen before. And uh, this is uh, work sort of looking at protein families. It's not just adding new members to, new, to known families. We're constantly discovering new gene families, new protein families that have never been seen before. So we're still at the early phases of discovering uh, what our environment is. With stem cell genomics, uh, obviously uh, uh, this ability to make iPS cells is, is a tremendous uh, advance. And I've argued for a long time the only way to understand the human genome is to understand stem cells. And, and now it's uh, turning around. The only way to understand stem cells is to understand the, the, the human genome. Uh, working with Larry Goldstein's group at UCSD, uh, because my genome had been sequenced, uh, we made uh, fibroblast cell lines and stem cell lines all the way to neuronal stem cells. And looking at these, there's genetic changes at every stage. And that's why the kind of studies that Lee mentioned of looking at cell-to-cell -cell interactions with system biology is so important. Just changing the cellular matrix that you grow stem cells on totally changes methylation patterns, changes uh, whether the DNA sequence uh, varies or not. So if we're going to be able to get stable stem cell lines that can actually, whether they're made from your biopsies or uh, even with embryonic stem cells, they all go through these genetic changes. So I told them I didn't want them to put the neurons they made uh, from my stem cells back in my brain right now. Uh, there's about uh, 30 oncogene uh, changes, for example. So uh, if they wait a while, maybe I won't mind so much. But uh, So the big question is, can we change these back? 
Uh, and we have a number of methods using our synthetic DNA approaches where we can correct errors uh, in the stem cell genome doing basically uh, in vitro gene therapy. Uh, but it's going to be much better if we can find ways of understanding the cell-to-cell -cell interactions to stabilize the genome uh, in the first place because the number of changes right now are really quite large. As Lee mentioned uh, several times, single cell genomics. So Roger Laskin at the Venture Institute really pioneered this, and uh, we've been looking at single uh, uh, stem cell uh, genomes. Uh, and the variation is tremendous in these cells, as you might expect. And so looking at transcriptomes, you can actually do uh, transcript analysis on single cells uh, in a relatively high throughput uh, manner. And the cell-to-cell -cell stochastic variation is tremendous. So I think it's, we're going to need very large populations and some of the microfluidic analyses that, that Lee mentioned to get to a point where this starts to make sense. So back in 1995, we actually sequenced two genomes. Uh, Homophilus was the first, and the mycoplasma genitalium was chosen because it has the smallest genome. And this was around the time where NASA scientists claimed they discovered nanobacterial fossils on a meteor from Mars. And a simple calculation uh, that nobody at NASA bothered to do, I guess, was the volume of these was so small they couldn't house a single protein or a single RNA or DNA uh, uh, molecule of, of any complexity whatsoever. But it got me and other people thinking about what minimal life was, how many of these uh, 500 or so genes were essential, what's, what's the smallest number of genes uh, to define uh, a cellular machinery. And then ultimately to answer it, could we design and construct uh, such a minimal cell? And as soon as we started asking those questions, it created all kinds of new questions. Would chemistry even permit us to make these large DNA molecules? And even if we could, would we just have large DNA molecules or is there a way to boot them up uh, and get something out of them? This started very slowly. Uh, in the mid to late 90s, uh, uh, Ham Smith and I took off a few years to sequence the human genome and then uh, got back to it in earnest. And the problem is uh, very little uh, work has been done until recently on DNA synthesis. Uh, it's all been focused on reading the genetic code and digitizing the information. DNA synthesizers, synthesizers are not very accurate machines. It's an N minus one situation, so the longer you make the piece of DNA, the more errors there are. So early on, we tried just uh, taking the PHIX uh, genome, which is only 5,000 letters. We made oligos from a good uh, quality source, PCR'd them up, um, and we got pieces the right size. But even with a million-fold selection from infectivity, we couldn't get one single active viral particle. So we knew we had to create error correction procedures. So Clyde Hutchinson, who originally uh, was our collaborator on the Mycoplasma Project, uh, joined the Institute, and he and him and I have been driving this program for almost 15 years now. And this was the early study where we managed to come up with some error correction procedures. Starting with the digital PHIX genome, uh, we made uh, this uh, genome, uh, got it error corrected, and, and then injected it into E. coli. And this is the actual uh, first experimental slide. But, so this is a lawn of E. coli. In every place there's active virus, you get a clear plaque because uh, it kills uh, the E. coli. So the, the synthetic piece of DNA was read as though it was normal uh, viral uh, DNA. So we call this a, a case uh, where the software, the DNA software, builds its own hardware. The virus wasn't there. All we put in was a synthetic piece of DNA. It led to the proteins. The protein self-assembled, uh, formed the virus, and the virus uh, turned around and killed the cells. Uh, so we didn't want to make viruses. We wanted to make very large pieces of DNA. But we figured if we could make viral-sized genomes accurately, we could make a whole bunch of those and try and find a way to string them together. Uh, and, and that's the route uh, we took. Uh, this looks like a, a Final Four uh, playoff. Uh, we basically made uh, PHIX uh, size uh, pieces. Uh, we put four of those together to make 24 KB pieces. And at each stage, we cloned these in E. coli, uh, isolated a lot of DNA, sequenced it, because we wanted to make sure these procedures were really robust, then used those for the next stage assembly. So then we made 72 KB pieces. Uh, then put two of those together to make 144 KB pieces. 
And at this stage, we start to run into problems with uh, exhausting the ability of E. coli to take large pieces uh, of DNA. So we looked around for an additional system, uh, and it turns out Saccharomyces uh, has ability to take up large pieces of DNA, and its homologous recombination system allows us to put them together. So we found just by uh, putting these four synthetic quarter molecules into yeast uh, with a cloning vector that has an artificial yeast centromere in it, uh, yeast would just put these pieces together by homologous uh, uh, combination. And uh, that led in, in 2008 to the first complete synthesis of a, a bacterial chromosome, uh, this being about uh, 600,000 base pairs. And this was the uh, largest uh, chemical of a defined uh, substance uh, made uh, until uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the process of chemistry has improved tremendously. Uh, a young postdoc at the time, Dan Gibson, uh, had uh, great advances in this. He got things down to a, a single pot chemistry. So just putting uh, three enzymes together at 50 degrees centigrade, we can just, uh, single pot reaction, single temperature, uh, just throw in the oligonucleotides and end up with nicely assembled pieces of DNA if the oligos are designed properly. And the nice thing about this, uh, the exonuclease, which has to trim back on one strand to get pieces to go together, is killed at 50 degrees centigrade. So it trims back just long enough uh, for uh, the pieces to create the proper uh, overlaps. This now allows for complete automation of this process. So that uh, test tube uh, discovery has now allowed us to start with just the digital world uh, and go out in a robotic fashion to make a much larger and larger pieces of DNA. And this was, uh, the early test was just making the mouse uh, mitochondrial uh, genome. You can now uh, buy uh, this uh, in a kit form from uh, New England Biolabs. Uh, so the Gibson Assembly uh, Master Mix uh, is already changing uh, how people are doing assembly. And it's now a very short, simple process to make any gene that you need versus having to order it from someplace or how the field used to run 20 years ago. People controlled the science by limiting who they gave their clones to. Now if the digital information is available, anybody in the world can make those same pieces of DNA uh, and ultimately the same uh, genomes. So the chemistry was getting better and better. Uh, we had a separate team working on the biology, and they came up with what I think is actually one of the most uh, important studies that, that we've published, uh, and that is by changing the genome in a cell, we can completely convert one species into another, and this becomes critical for systems biology and every other part of biology. So I'll walk you through it just because uh, it, it is important uh, uh, for understanding the rest of synthetic biology. So w the initial experiments were done with native chromosomes. Um, we had two closely related species of mycoplasma, roughly the same distance apart as we are from mice. We isolated the chromosome from M. mycoides, and early on we were trying to work out whether naked DNA could be used for transplantation. So we would treat this harshly with proteases to get rid of all the proteins. And we added a couple of uh, markers to it, a TEDM uh, selection system and LAXZ, so it would turn cells uh, bright blue. And we had to work out all kinds of new techniques because you can't pipette whole chromosomes without uh, shearing them. And we also worked out it's only uh, supercoil DNA that can be transplanted. Uh, so we have to move the DNA, the chromosomes, around in gel blocks, and it takes a lot of special handling. But we worked out procedures uh, to do this and transplant these into recipient cells. Uh, and uh, we have this uh, very high-tech movie to show you what we think happened. Uh, so, so we uh, insert the uh, mycoides chromosome into the uh, Capricolum cells. And one of two things happened. Uh, obviously, the DNA started to be read immediately and started making proteins. Some of the proteins produced were restriction enzymes that recognized the Capricolum genome as foreign DNA and chewed it up. Uh, the other model is just the two chromosomes segregate into separate cells and because we can select for them. Uh, but either way, we end up with a Capricolum cell with a mycoides set of uh, genetic software. So what happened? In, in a very short period of time, we ended up with these bright blue cells. 
And when we interrogated them at every level, including sequencing all the proteins in the cells, there wasn't a single Capricolum molecule left in these cells. Uh, everything in the cell derived from the new mycoides chromosome that we put into the cell. Um, I mean, th th this is pretty well known, but people don't think about it. If you take DNA out of the cell, cells die. Uh, so many people, if, if you know, this was a huge battle that probably held up the discovery of DNA as genetic material. Biochemists, even though I trained as a biochemist for a while, uh, held the world captive by thinking that genetic material had to be proteins. Uh, and a lot of people are still trying to build artificial cells just by putting proteins in them. You can't have life without DNA because the protein turnover is so fast. Uh, the new chromosome gets read within seconds of putting it in the cell. Uh, over 10% of the proteins uh, turn over in a typical bacterial cell every hour. Uh, so it would be like driving an early Hyundai or something. You know, you had to replace so many parts uh, 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 quite quickly. But imagine if you had to replace 10% of the parts uh, every hour. So these cells are totally uh, driven by the chromosome that's in. Life is a DNA software system. You change that DNA software and you change the species. Uh, even uh, early on senior scientists thought this was an artifact and we must have had contamination uh, at somewhere along the line and, and didn't believe it uh, fully until we did this with a synthetic chromosome. So we knew we could do transplantation, we knew we could synthesize DNA, uh, but we had a problem that some of you will recognize. We were actually making the bacterial DNA in a eukaryotic cell. So we had to find a way how to get the bacterial chromosome out of yeast to transplant it into bacteria. So this led to a whole series of developments where we can now clone uh, routinely entire bacterial chromosomes in yeast just by adding an artificial yeast centromere to the bacterial cells. Uh, and this is a tremendous advantage for making rapid changes in these genomes using the yeast homologous recombination system. And they're very stably maintained. Uh, unlike uh, what was thought with uh, early yaks with human DNA, but nobody ever took the time to clone out stable cells. They just looked at mixed populations. So now we had the Mycoplasma mycoides genome in yeast, so we could try isolating it from yeast and transplanting it. And when we did this, we ran into a major problem. It didn't work. And so we had to deconvolute the entire system to work out what was different with the chromosome in yeast than the chromosome out of the mycoides cell. And it's somewhat ironic, because uh, my friend and colleague in all this work, Ham Smith, got the Nobel Prize for discovering restriction endonucleases. It turns out the genome in mycoides was methylated, and yeast doesn't have the methylation systems. So uh, we proved this by isolating all the methylases uh, uh, from the cell, and if we took the chromosome out of yeast and then methylated it, we could then transplant it. And what there is is an overlapping uh, restriction endonuclease in the Capricolum cells. So as soon as we put in the DNA out of yeast, it was chewed up. And we ultimately proved this by taking the restriction enzyme gene out of the Capricolum genome. In that case, we can take naked DNA unmethylated out of yeast and transplant it. So uh, we published this paper, we thought we had solved the entire problem, uh, we could get uh, bacterial chromosomes, synthetic or otherwise, into yeast, assemble them in yeast, you can make changes in yeast using homologous recombination, you can just work your way around this circle. In fact, had we had this technology initially, we probably never would have developed synthetic cells, because uh, this is a way to serially remove all the genes from a genome, uh, which you couldn't do uh, with selectical markers. So at this stage, we thought we'd solved everything. We had new chemistry. We decided to make the 1.1 million base pair mycoides uh, genome because uh, we had solved all the things with it. And this went uh, uh, in weeks instead of years. Um, first making 1 kb pieces, uh, putting 10 of those together to make 10 kb pieces, 10 of those together to make 100 kb pieces. And we put 1,100 kb pieces into yeast and it assembled the entire genome. We did the transplantation and it didn't work. Uh, 
So software engineers have uh, debugging software to debug uh, their computer software. So we had to create the biological equivalent of debugging software. And what we did was make corresponding 100 KB pieces from the native microides genome. And we could substitute these one at a time and get transplantation. And we found we could have 10 synthetic segments, uh, and the last segment had to be from the native genome. Uh, and so we went back and resequenced that 100 KB piece using Sanger technology. We had sequenced it with next gen technology. Every type of next gen technology has systematic errors that it makes. It's highly reproducible, but there are errors. In this case, it missed a single base pair deletion in the DNA A gene, which is essential. So that showed up with Sanger sequencing. Uh, we went back, made the change, did the transplantation, and we finally got successful transplants uh, using the synthetic genome. Uh, the first time we did this, we only got uh, one colony, uh, but it's gone through billions of replications, and now it's uh, much more uh, reproducible, and we get hundreds uh, per transplant. So how do we know it was synthetic DNA and not a contaminant? Uh, early on, uh, that was our biggest worry. So we found ways to novelly watermark the genetic code. We did this in the first genome just by using the single amino acid letter code to write the names of the scientists and the institutions in the, in the genome. But it wasn't, wasn't very satisfactory and you don't have the complete alphabet. So we invented a whole new code and, and people have used ASCII code. And, by the way, when we sent this paper uh, to science uh, for review, one of the reviews came back written entirely in DNA code. Uh, it frustrated the journal editor to, to no end. Uh, and we decoded that pretty easily because what people have been using for a long time is just ASCII code. But ASCII code is a disaster biologically. It's great if you're sending code. Uh, so we invented a code that puts in frequent stop codons because we don't want to make new peptides with, uh, that can end up toxins or have other biological activity. So in the first watermark, uh, there's the, the, it shows you how to decode everything else there. And we can have the entire alphabet uh, with punctuation and, uh, and a numerical system. And also there's a URL. And we didn't tell people what this code was initially uh, when we announced the uh, genome. And as people solved the code, they sent an email to the genome and uh, uh, showed that they had been able to decode it. And once a number of people had done that, the, the first one happened in four hours, which it was somebody at the Institute, I think they cheated, but um, uh, most people did it within three or four days. Um, uh, and then it revealed that we had 46 names in the genome. And, and with the first genome, I, I was told that I wasn't being very creative. We didn't put anything poetic in the genome, such as one small step for bacteria. Or, you know, so, so, so I went further this time, and I came up with three quotations uh, that I put in. And I think you can read these, but the first is from James Joyce, to live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. That, that seemed appropriate. Uh, the second is from Oppenheimer's biography, American Prometheus, see things not as they are, but as they might be, trying to look ahead. <laughs> and the third is from Richard Feynman, uh, which I think is the most important tenet for this entire field, what I cannot build, I cannot understand. And this has been the tenet of chemistry. Uh, as chemists solve uh, chemical structures, you had to resynthesize it to prove, in fact, that it had the right uh, uh, properties. So, you know, all this went along pretty well, and then until uh, we got a letter from James Joyce, a state attorney, uh, uh, saying that you did not get permission to use this quotation in the uh, genome. James Joyce was dead. I didn't really know how to ask him. Uh, and it turns out there's fair use provisions that allows you to quote up to a paragraph without, uh, without uh, permission. So we solved that one pretty fast. And then we started getting uh, emails from a Caltech scientist saying we had mis misquoted Richard Feynman. <laughs> and if you look on the internet, you'll find thousands and thousands of copies of this quotation. And we argued with this guy, here's what we found, and including in, in Feynman's biography. Uh, and so this guy sent a picture of Feynman's blackboard with the original quotation, which is, I, I think, much better. What I cannot create, I do not understand. Uh, so we've gone back and changed the genetic code so uh, Feynman will rest uh, comfortably. Um, 
But this shows that you know, by having a watermark DNA as the only DNA in the cell, um, plus lots of other changes we made uh, in the genome, uh, that is clearly only the synthetic DNA in the cell. And every protein, every function in the cell derived from that DNA. It's the first time, even though everybody who works in this field takes for granted that DNA is the genetic material and everything derives from it, as people have started to go in the field of epigenetics, they've tried to get away that there must be something other than DNA. All epigenetics still starts with the genetic code, uh, and, and these studies uh, approved it. We're trying to take this further now. We're doing a grand experiment, both between Synthetic Genomics and the Venture Institute, trying to design de, de novo a, uh, a genome, uh, a minimal genome based uh, on all these studies. And it's not a trivial exercise. Knocking out genes with transposon mutagenesis, there's over 100 genes in these simple cells that are essential for life. You kill that gene, uh, disrupt it, the cell dies. We have no idea what the function is. Makes it kind of hard to do complete systems biology when a quarter of the genes are of completely unknown function other than the cell can't live without them. Uh, so that makes it hard to do de novo design as well. So uh, we're designing around that and including all of those, but we're trying to do it on a logical fashion, and, and we're taking bets now within the organizations. We've designed two genomes, a super aggressive one and one that's a little bit more conservative, and over the next uh, several weeks, we're going to see if we can actually get a living cell out of it. Uh, if so, then systems biology will, will be real. <laughs> um, so where are we going with this? Uh, uh, the, the 60 million genes is now out of date. It's more like 100 million. It doesn't matter what the number is. View them as design components. The same way the electronics industry had resistors and capacitors, ultimately transistors, integrated circuits, all the things that have been built with a small number of components, by that standard we have infinite components. We actually have at Synthetic Genomics, we have computer software to design DNA software trying to design a new species. Uh, and a key part of this uh, going forward is, you know, getting control and safety with these organisms so they don't live outside the environment uh, that you intend uh, for them. So we're trying to design a number of cells, uh, primarily trying to use uh, the best energy source we have on this planet, sunlight, and uh, the best carbon source is CO2. Instead of seeing CO2 as a waste product, we see it as the raw material of the future. And we have major programs in new foods, uh, fuels, uh, and various uh, chemicals. And uh, just some hints of some of these, the, the most advances we've made are actually in the vaccine area. Uh, we now working with Novartis, had the first genomic-based vaccine that just came on the market this year in Europe. It's the type B meningitis. But this was a genome that we sequenced in 1996. It took over 50 years to get this out, in part from having to do uh, clinical trials in large number of infants, uh, but it's a very effective genome design vaccine that works against all strains of meningitis B. What we've been concentrating on is actually influenza, because we decided that might be the best case for need for rapid construction of genomes. And uh, my institute is one of the major centers in the world that have been sequencing the influenza isolates uh, uh, from around the world and comparing their genomes and trying to understand those. And what we've developed using a synthetic DNA process is trying to go from uh, months of work to get an isolate each year that's used for the flu vaccine down to less than a week. Uh, and we've been sex successful doing this as the project funded by BARDA and with uh, Novartis. BARDA sends us a putative pandemic sequence by email, and uh, we have less than 24 hours to construct that new uh, virus uh, DNA that we then have to get right away to, uh, uh, to Novartis, uh, who has this multi-billion dollar facility uh, in North Carolina for growing uh, flu virus in MDC K cells. And so we think we're actually pandemic ready. We have it down to five days uh, for the entire process. Uh, two of those days are transportation related issues. 
So uh, the synthesis is virtually immediate. And so we're working with the FDA and others now trying to get this to work uh, for seasonal view flu and, and get that accepted. Uh, we are working on microbial environments and, and creating unique ones uh, for use in things like microbial fuel cells. And we have major efforts at the Venture Institute and SGI on this. And we can take uh, literally a human waste sludge in a very short period of time just using microbial fuel cells with selected uh, uh, microbes and totally clarify uh, that water. Um, it's not uh, uh, drinkable uh, water, but it's useful for agriculture at that stage. And just one more step would make it uh, completely drinkable. But we can take, uh, in fact, large industrial waste streams and uh, totally clarify the water. All the carbons used for metabolism, and we generate a fair amount of electricity in the process. So instead of requiring electricity to clean up these systems, we actually generate it, uh, and it's faster and cheaper. And we can also, we have versions that will work for desalinization. I, I think ultimately, um, the elimination of agriculture as we know it should be a goal of modern science. Agriculture developed as, uh, and allowed humanity to develop and, and societies to develop. But it's incredibly inefficient, particularly now, uh, as of last October, that we now have 7 billion people on the planet. In 11 years, we're going to have 8 billion. Uh, and in 30 years, maybe over uh, 10 billion people. Uh, if you look at corn, which much of the U.S. economy is based, when you look at oil from corn, it's 18 gallons per acre per year. Uh, the top is oil palm, it's around 600 gallons per acre per year. So that's why a palm oil is, is such an efficient process, but that only works plus or minus 5 degrees or 8 degrees from the equator, and it takes five years to establish uh, uh, these uh, systems. In contrast, the, the numbers that are thrown around are 10 to 15,000 gallons per year for algae. It turns out these are totally fictitious numbers. These are goals. A natural algae, the best they produce is on the order of 2,000 gallons per year. And the same experiment gets done over and over and over again that's been done for the last 50 years of trying to find natural algae, grow it in large ponds, and find that uh, it either gets contaminated with uh, things blowing around in the air or doesn't produce uh, much oil. So we've concentrated a huge team on trying to engineer hundreds and hundreds of different parameters in the algae cell, actually trying to make a synthetic algae cell that controls all these. And, and we have some progress, and we have a test facility uh, uh, in, uh, in La Jolla trying uh, different uh, algae that we've engineered on a larger and larger scale. But this is not a short-term prospect. Um, uh, I think uh, there's not going to be anything that's economically viable in the next five uh, possibly even 10 years uh, on the market. But we just acquired an 80-acre facility out in the California desert just for scaling up some of the testing of some of the new strains we're developing. Uh, ethics has uh, been a key part from the early stages of the Genome Project. And uh, as soon as we knew we were going to go down the road of making new uh, types of cells, we asked for ethical review. Uh, the first one was published in Science in 1999. Uh, this has been an ongoing issue. The Sloan Foundation has funded uh, uh, several studies, uh, both with my institute, MIT, and the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, looking mostly at security issues. And when we made our announcement uh, in 2010, President Obama asked his uh, new bioethics commission to take this on as their number one issue. And uh, anybody interested in this field should really download and read this report. I think they did an excellent job uh, for how to balance the, the good and the risk in a new emerging field. Uh, but one of the key things that we stressed, and they stress a lot in this, is coming up with new circuitry for biocontainment, uh, suicide genes, other things to control uh, organisms as they're developed. So in summary, we're working on uh, everything we've learned uh, from genomics, from reading the genetic code to starting to write it. And so now we have the systems to, in fact, test ideas, test data, test all the things that are coming out of system biology predictions to do as the chemist did, go the other way, actually synthesize it, we can test it to see uh, if it has any real value. 
Thank you very much.